Hi, I'm Judd Carlton. This is the Psyched Up About Money blog. Today we have Margarita Kosh. Margarita is the go-to healthcare policy strategist. She works with healthcare professionals to design a modern healthcare experience. And she's fluent in regulatory compliance, insurance payer language, and interstate licensing. Margarita, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Awesome, excited to be here. Yeah, very happy to have you. So you do so much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do it alone. <laughs> I, I am not a single payer ship. I, I, I have a wonderful, wonderful team behind me that is, I'm blessed to be able to have. <laughs> That's great because, uh, yeah, you seem like a real powerhouse. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, you put out a lot of great resources. You're involved in so many things. Um, maybe one thing that I found really interesting was uh, the interstate licensing. Because uh, I have heard that that can be a real challenge. Um, what are what are sort of the, the opportunities and challenges there? Oh, gosh. So, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities and challenges, especially as a result of COVID. So I kind of like to say that COVID didn't do a lot of great things. In fact, like, you know, pretty much ruined a lot of our lives, but we could always be thankful to COVID for one thing that it did very well. It propelled telehealth adoption in a way that we were about seven to 10 years away, especially in the mental health realm. So my niche and my passion is reproductive and mental health. Those are just the kinds of providers that I, because of what I put out, I gravitate towards me and I gravitate towards uh, as well. But I do work, you know, we work with different providers. And what we found especially interesting within the past year as a result of COVID in terms of licensure is that um, there have been executive orders that have been issued, not just by the government. So if you're gonna take your health and human services, your centers for Medicare and Medicaid, you know, and whatever the presidential executive orders that came out, you will see that there were executive orders that came out from the actual states themselves that allowed for certain uh, provisions that we historically did not have, which were, which were because of the result of the executive orders of the federal government. So for example, what do I mean by that? Um, if you take a look at the state like Wisconsin, uh, what they had done was they have uh, expanded telehealth or regular temporary licensure in their state to practice, uh, for example, for mental health therapists up until uh, Mar uh, June 31st. Now I'm trying to figure out if June has 31 days or 30 days. That's not my specialty. But, um, you know, whatever the last day of June is, that's until when providers that are, for example, in Florida or in, you know, New York or in Vermont or in Alaska or Nevada, if they have patients or they want to treat patients that are in Wisconsin, then they can do a temporary licensure in Wisconsin and they can treat those patients. Now, what we have done really, really well, according to our clients, we could pat ourselves on the back as much as we want, but this comes directly from our clients, is that we're able to provide for them really a path to understand the picture of what licensure looks like. So we help them not just in the phase of licensing, of getting a license, but we educate them. We're very big on education because we want them to understand what the role looks like. Why? Uh, every no two states are alike. Licensure in different states, we were just talking about it, right? Licensure in different states looks differently. So we help them understand what that looks like. We address the questions that they don't even know to ask, and we provide them with the information as well as the resources. So they, at the end of the day, they don't necessarily need to even use our services. Um, they could actually do everything themselves because we provide them a literal how-to which is not the same as if they were gonna go on the website and they were going to read what the requirements are. Uh, we give a few more extra steps than that. Um, so I think I could keep talking about it. So I'll just stop and let you kind of drive it a little bit further. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I do wanna hear more about it. You know, so when, when I'm curious, the, the sort of initial question when someone reaches out to you and it's that question of, is it, is it oftentimes that they've just heard that yeah. this sort of technological, thing happening right and we're all you know doing video calls all the time and, and it's fantastic that that made such a huge leap in such a 
short period of time, right? You said that it's like the one silver lining of yeah. what happened last year. Um, is it, is it often sort of a, 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 a sort of a vague question? Like, uh, it seems like I could be doing something. Yeah. What do Actually, I do? What it is, is it's either that they've heard about us because we were on a blog, for example, uh, uh, on a podcast, like we were on a Gordon, uh, Gordon Brewer's podcast, The Practice, Practice of Therapy, and he's a wonderful, incredibly brilliant clinician who also happens to go out of his way to help folks. And as you guys do in your own realm, right? So um, what we had done was they would reach out to us because they heard something we mentioned or they found something that we had written. But then the best questions are the ones, hey, um, so my client is taking a three month engagement in Vermont and they have, they're gonna be there physically. Can I treat my client? You know, we always let folks know we are not lawyers. You know, I'm not trying pretending to be a lawyer, but because we've been doing this for 20 plus years, we also understand regulatory compliance and we understand that we will advise them based on what the, what the uh, licensing rules are of that state, because, we have been doing licensure for so many years. I myself have been in healthcare since 1995, uh, no, 1997 there, 1997. So I have kind of had this experience in regulatory compliance and navigating um, all the requirements and understanding where to find the information and where to dig for the information. We present it to them in a way that they could actually assess it and make an, their own decision. And then where we have connections with law firms, we will even recommend that they speak to a law firm, but they actually present them the information as opposed to asking for an opinion that's going to cost them $35,000, uh, not hundred, because, you know, they don't know where to start. We'll say, you know, this is what questions you should be asking. So they'll reach out to us and we will explain to them, this is what it looks like. Are you essentially, are you looking for a scope of practice question? Are you looking to find out if there's a continuity of care in Vermont or whatever state you're going into? Are you looking to find out whether or not your licensure type is acceptable in that state without continuity of care or if you have to be get a temporary licensure or a full-blown licensure? So these are all of the different things that we're going to look at. Or we just have somebody that says, I'm done. I don't want to have pay an office. I'm saving so much money having my own practice in my own little couch. So I want to establish a practice, but I want to practice everywhere. And we, we get into that. What do you mean everywhere? Which state are you looking at? Because if you're going to go and you're going to try to practice in a state where you have no relationships with any patients, there's no continuity of care. And that state requires that you're fully licensed. We need to explore what that looks like before you decide that you're going to have this telehealth practice without actually stepping foot. One of the things that I kind of repeatedly is surprising when clients hear this is they're like, well, you know what? They have insurance that I'm in network with, so I'm going to go and I'm going to treat them in that state. I'm like, okay, now we're going to come down to kind of the bread and the butter of it. Question number one does that state allow you to practice in that state without a licensure? Is there continuity of care? Before we even start talking about seeing that patients through their insurance, because at the end of the day, what it comes down to is most state licensing of uh, legislature will indicate that if you, 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 you need to know if you're allowed to practice there because it's always where your patient is located. It's not about where you are. It's where your patient is. So if your patient is on vacation somewhere else and you're going to try and see that patient wherever they are through telehealth, you need to understand what the rules and regulations of that state are because you might be in trouble. Mm -hmm. And that's very important, regardless of what you sign with the patient, regardless of the patient signs of some kind of a release it comes back to you physically taking space in another state without you physically taking space because you're using telehealth. So you need to understand what the scope of your practice is, what the rules for um, you know, continuity of care are, and what that state believes is whether or not you're allowed to actually practice there. Because no two states are like, I wish to God that there were, but they're not. So that's what we have to take a look at outside of looking at the telehealth laws, most of which still don't even have anything to do with 
mental health services, because if you look at the telehealth laws in a lot of these states, they're going to have a definition of which professionals are allowed to do telehealth. And they're now going to list licensed family marriage therapists, licensed mental health counselors, so on and so forth. You have to really be specific in understanding what you're looking for before you you even start thinking about what to do when you get there. Wow. Um, so it's complex <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, well, we break it down. I make it sound complex and I'm working on that, but we do break it down. I mean, uh, to be honest, I think what our clients have said when we, we provide them with interstate licensing reports and those reports are basically like, let's say, I simply put, if you were, let's say, an LMHC, like a licensed mental health counselor in New York, and you wanted to practice in Illinois, then the report would indicate I am an LMHC in New York, I will be an LCPC in Illinois. So it'll tell you what your licensure type would be because unfortunately, one of the other problems we have in terms of licensing is not only do we not have standardization, but we have a vast discrepancy in licensure type that I know I might get some love and I might get some equal hate mail for this, but they're essentially the same thing. Whether you're a licensed professional counselor, which is an LPC, a licensed clinical professional counselor, a licensed certified professional counselor, a licensed professional mental health counselor, licensed professional clinical counselor. I mean, all of there's 10 abbreviation types for the same licensure in all of our states. That is sheer lunacy that directly contributes to the mental health crisis in this country because we have such a vast difference of the licensing standards in the mental health profession. So, so, so thinking like to the example you gave of, of somebody who calls you and says, you know, I, I'm embracing the technology. I want to be virtual and practice no matter where, you know, maybe start taking or soliciting and taking patients across the country, help me flip the switch. Is it, is it realistic to, to be able to actually practice in all 50 yes. states? And Absolutely. People, some people are actually achieving that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're not doing it alone. They have clinical care teams because they're going to have other therapists. So <laughs> we're looking at their at licensure of, you know, I don't know any one therapist who's licensed in all 50 states and actively seeing all patients in all 50 states because the whole entire purpose for them to be licensed in other states is to create a caseload that they can manage, a caseload that they want to actually have. It's, it does, it's not efficient or financially solvent for them to pay all of this money. I'm not talking about for us. I mean, like to the licensing boards, because don't forget all of those licensing boards have their own fees, right? Mm -hmm. um, so. You know, we have providers that are licensed in about 13, 14 states, not a problem, uh, because then they are seeing the kind of caseload that they want to see. Is it possible to be licensed in all 50 states? Absolutely. You just have to be sure that you are welcoming and open to the licensing standards of those states. Case point, some states might not care if you've been practicing for 25 years and you already have, you know, you wrote dozens of books and you are a medical director, I'm, I'm sorry, and you're, you're a clinical director or you are an author and you're a professor. Like if they require that you take the one of the two tests that are issued by the NBC, uh, by the mental now I can't even speak. Uh, if they, you know, if you if you do not take the um, test that they offer, then you're gonna have to take the test that they offer, and that's not even like the jurisprudence exam that I, folks might have to take in every single state that they go into if they offer that state. But there's different licensing standards, continuing education units, but. Where a lot of confusion is the point at which these things have to be taken, if there's a workaround behind it, whether it's actually required, even though the website says it is, and that's kind of where we come in, because we'll break it down, we find the back channel ways, um, case point, there was a provider who was trying to get licensed, I think it was either in Hawaii or in the VOD, it was in Hawaii, um, and they needed letters from their medical dean or like the dean of, of school who oversaw their supervision. And this provider hasn't, you know, they graduated school in like 1997. She's like 
um, I know for a fact that he's dead. Like, what do you want me to do? So, you know, um, we got in touch with, with the licensing board in Hawaii. And uh, we said, look, this is the situation. A lot of times these providers, they don't have access to these people. So they provide us with a workaround of what we can achieve. But it also has to do with the fact that we're establishing relationships with these licensing bodies and licensing boards. So they know who we are when we, a lot of times it doesn't take that long for us to tell them who we are. And they're like, yeah, we know who you are. <laughs> we, <That's great. laughs> we've dealt with you guys before, or, you know, like we understand what you're looking to achieve and they do prefer dealing with us. And I don't think we actually mentioned it. So I'm the CEO and founder of MK Medical Solutions. That's the name of the company that's the consulting firm that does a lot of these services. And so um, they like dealing with us because a lot of times what happens is that when providers call in, providers are these you know doctors, therapists, professionals, there's a lot of pain. And uh, one second, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this I'm not, now not in Florida. I'm actually staying in New York for a little bit. Um, oh, nice. Some family stuff, but um, you know, a lot of these what what they say to us, the licensing boards are like, we like dealing with you guys because you're straight to the point. You don't get emotional, and you can't blame the providers. They're frustrated. They're like, I've been on hold for five hours. You hung up on me six times in that time, and before I could even get to you, like. You know, I've submitted my application 20 times. Why isn't it there? there there's passion and there's anger. Well, rightfully so, right? Because they're like, we've been, this is annoying. Why do I have to keep doing this? But when we call, before we even call, we take a look at the application. And we will know what was wrong with it before we even get to them. Because we kind of, we have that trained eye so we can see what the licensing body is going to be like, okay, well, the copy of this license is not clear. The signature is not there. Um, you provided one of the two required documents and they said that they wanted the other documents, but you read it as optional. Like before we even get there, we kind of have that QA, quality analysis perception, so we can see what could be wrong and how we could fix it before we even get there. So it's kind of like that symbiotic relationship where we alleviate a lot of the tension that's in the waters. <laughs> yeah, I, there, I love that your firm is there. You're there to guide people through this. I mean, I, I think about it. I would reach out to you as like step one <laughs> if you're even thinking about it, right? Because otherwise it's just all the time and, and the stress and hassle. Of, of just like, you don't even know what you don't know. So you're finding mm -hmm. that out. And, and I, so I, I've dealt with a lot of government agencies in a lot of different ways and a lot of back offices of large corporations. And, and over the last year, it's been this simultaneous shift in technology. And in many cases, this overwhelming demand for their services all happening at the same time, combined with the fact that for maybe six months, they were shut down and there's a yeah. massive backlog that they have to work through and, and just navigating all of that, anything you can do to smooth it out <laughs> is, is probably worth doing. And I'm, I'm taking it back just for a second to the um, uh, working across you know, different states. Um, do, do you see that the direction is changing much? I mean, I feel like that just the existence of <clears throat> yours is a big step in facilitating this, but, but even beyond that from, <clears throat> state's perspective is anything changing i mean yes some like using telemedicine increased a lot but hopefully that that it continues to increase you know like you mentioned um the one state maybe i think it was wisconsin where there's like this sort of impending deadline like we're not that far away from the end of june you know what like do you think it's going to continue i mean i would imagine that the people using it are are completely in favor but hopefully that's who's being you know, consulted here? So that's actually a brilliant question. And I want to stick on the side of positivity. And I want to say that you can't put the genie back in the bottle. But I am very fearful and realistic that this country has, or humans, has have a very, very long standing history of not learning from our mistakes. Mm. And case point, the only reason why a lot of telehealth took off the way that it did when I first said we took off by seven to 10 years was because when the executive orders were enacted, what happened was that the health and human secretary, um, the secretary of health and human services also 
put into place, and I'm not going to get into the whole entire like political thing of it, but simply put, there were certain executive measures that were allowed to relax telehealth services laws from the HIPAA perspective of the Social Security Act, which basically said that before Medicare, and when Medicare puts out something, a lot of other folks follow. That's kind of how it works. That's why a lot of other insurers started to set up within a few days after the executive orders were issued by the Trump administration that a lot of other payers were like jumping on the bandwagon saying, okay, we're going to cover this. We're going to bill for it the way we want to. The thing with what you're saying is that when the executive orders are going to be relaxed, then we're no longer going to be in the state of national emergency. The question is going to remain, What's going to happen to that measure that basically said before the pandemic, patients who were home were not allowed to essentially use telehealth services. Medicare wouldn't pay for them because the patient was at home. Medicare defined distant and originating sites. This is basically where the patient is versus where the provider is. And they said, yeah, sure, you could do telehealth services, except the patient can't be home. The patient needs to be inside of another healthcare provider's office, inside of a mobile clinic in the rural area, pretty much anywhere except for home. They started to pay for certain telehealth services, but they weren't the scale of the services that they're getting paid for now. So to your point, I want to say that all of, everybody that followed that measure, the executive orders that were issued by the states themselves, the licensing bodies, the insurance payers, they're all going to say, wait a minute, we've had this experiment and we see that it worked. Care continues. People are able to get services and still improve their healthcare outcomes, right? I want to say that we're going to continue to see this uh, this form of um, you know progress in healthcare and innovation, but I'm very mindful, and I urge everybody to scream off the top of their lungs to their assemblymen, Congress people, everybody that's in their legislature, to pick up the phone while we're still in it, as opposed to being reactive after the fact and saying, "What are you doing about this measure that 11:35, which is also in the blog, enacted?" The 1135 waiver was what was what, what basically allowed us to utilize all of these services and what essentially said the Health and Human Secretary, uh, Health and Human Service Secretary said, hey, you could you Medicare patients are allowed to be at home to use all of these services, which is why everybody else kind of followed suit. So to answer your question, I want to be hopeful and say we're going to continue to see this innovation. But my fear is that when we are out of this executive order and we're out of this national state of emergency, the rubber band bounces back. And then all of the Medicare, the Medicaid, the commercial payers, the executive orders, they're all going to say, no, no, we're losing too much money. We're going to have to figure out a different way of doing this. And we'll just wait another few years before we figure it out. Mm. That's my fear. Yeah. Well, I like the optimistic scenario you outlined. That would be much better. I want the optimistic scenario because I can tell you as somebody who is taking care of a parent, you know, here in New York, um, the amount of times that we were able to actually see her doctors through telehealth. And I myself have been seeing most of my healthcare professionals through telehealth because why the hell am I going to commute for an hour and a half? And be late and sit inside of a waiting room when I could just hop on the call like this and still have a regular conversation with my physician. You know, I'm not talking about getting MRIs or anything like that. Like we can do it and we have a responsibility to keep moving innovation forward because if we do, that's how all of the technology that we're using through remote patient monitoring, the wearables, that's how that's going to start moving forward to help us. That's how maybe five years from now, you could do this, put your hands on the screen, and maybe the screen is going to take some measures and tell your doctor exactly what, what they need to know from you and saves you a trip and allows you to use that time more proactively. You don't have to take off from work to go and see your doctor. You don't have to find a babysitter for your child. You don't have to sit in traffic for three hours there and back. You don't have to sit inside of a waiting room. And then all of the tax benefits to the providers that are actually creating at-home offices, right? So there's a lot of positivity there. I want to be hopeful. 
So, and, and do you see the, I'm curious, like the pace of um, providers who are interested in you know, expanding and, and adding these states to their licensure, um, do you see that that continues the pace or? Some any- states, I will tell you this much. There are certain states that did something really, really cool. So um, actually Florida did something cool and I wish that I would see a lot of other states do this. I haven't, <clears throat> not to the full scale that Florida did. Before um, the pandemic, even like a year before the pandemic, Florida did something called the, um, they have, let me just put it this way. It's the registry for out-of-state telehealth services. Let's put it that way. It's not a registry that makes you a telehealth provider. It's a registry that essentially gives you a certification that you're carrying your license to practice regardless of your state to the state of Florida. The reason why they did that is because Florida is known as what? Snowbird capital of the world. The amount of patients that would come there for the winters would have a direct impeding case of, you know, a continuity of care issues because the providers that were in the other states or if they were on Medicare, they would have to like keep switching their doctors and nobody, like it was a mess. So there was a bunch of other reasons, but essentially Florida said, forget about that. We're just going to let providers do this paperwork. And it takes them like, it takes like five to seven days to process. It's free, by the way. And that's it. Like providers can practice in the state of Florida. They could issue prescriptions in the state of Florida. The only caveat is that you promise that you're never going to physically practice medicine or whatever your specialty is in Florida. If you will, then you have to get actually licensed in Florida, the traditional route. But Like if you are a practitioner, regardless of your state, whether you're in Kentucky or you're in Mississippi or you're in Nevada and your patients are in Florida, you could do this certification and you could actually continue to treat them as though they were still at home without a problem. And if you need to issue them medication, then you will send them medication, not a problem. So to your point, Florida did that really well and it had nothing to do with COVID because they did that before. So my hope is that we could see other states saying, wait a minute, Florida did that. It's possible. And it had nothing to do with COVID. Why can't we figure out a way to do that as well? Because guess what? People don't just vacation in Florida. <laughs> you know? So I, I think that, 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 are, that is an opportunity that we could take a look at in the case for policy perspective of where it works. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That sounds like a great example to hold up for other states who are at least thinking about it, or they should be. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I'm not sure if that answers your full question, though, but that was an example that really jumped into my mind that a lot of, we recommend that to a lot of our clients. They're like, look, it doesn't cost you anything, and it takes like just a few documentations to complete, and you don't have to take a test. Yeah. And I would think, you know, especially if, uh, you know, so I'm located in New Jersey, you know, close to New York and right. I see the, <laughs> the, the diaspora there and, and the back and forth and the connection. So I would imagine many uh, mental health professionals in this area end up uh, working with people in Florida. You know, I'm sure <laughs> they may not even realize they're being, you know, contacted from Florida part of the time, yeah. but um, it would seem like a natural fit there. Absolutely. And, you know, the beauty of the uh, reciprocity, not reciprocity, the registration in Florida is that it's not just for mental health professionals. It doesn't matter what your licensure type is. I mean, they pretty much, it's open to pretty much, as far as I recall, almost everybody. I think, you know, the exception is like a radiologist that can't, well, but you can still read a test. So (laughs) you can read the report. So never mind. I think nursing might be a little bit different, but, um, you know, other than that, it's pretty good. Yeah, but, but that's the only one that is as open as that? As open, as far as I recall, that's the only one that's as open um, with the process. Let's put it that way, with okay. the process itself. Yeah. Great. Uh, well, Margarita, thank you so much for taking the time to explain this um, opportunity and give us a sense of more about how it works and and just to know that you're a resource that, that can help people who are looking into it. Um, you, we, will you recap for a second how people can find you and get in touch with you and hear more of your thoughts? 
Absolutely. So the best way they could visit us on our website, mkmedicalsolutions.com. On LinkedIn or on Facebook, I am Margarita Hosh. We also have the company uh, MK Medical Solutions LLC on both platforms. On Instagram, really active there, starting to get more active at MK Med Consultant. And on Twitter, I am at Margarita Hosh. If they're on Clubhouse, find me. Chances are I'm probably going to be in a room talking about licensure or about building relationships with payers and uh, how to, you know, have a seat at the negotiating table when you're renegotiating your contract. Um, so yeah, that at MK Med Consultant or at Margarita Hosh across social media. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much.